this YouTube video is about bonsai pots. It's a subject which is very dear to my heart and as I explain and uh, talk about the pots you realize why it is such an important facet of this very interesting subject. As most of you will know that bonsai is really the two words bon and sai and it simply means a pot and a tree but most of you will also know that simply having a tree in a pot does not make a bonsai. Take this for instance this little juniper is in a flower pot but it's not quite a bonsai yet because it's not in a proper bonsai pot. It's only when the tree starts getting put in a nice ceramic pot or a contemporary pot like this or a beautiful juniper like this that you'll realize that the tree and the pot are one entity. The two go together. So bonsai or the tree in a pot simply means the entire composition of tree in a pot makes the work of art. So we will explain to you why the pot is such an integral and important part of bonsai. This is a view of our pot shop at Heron's Bonsai and as you can see it's a huge array of pots, all different types of pots ranging from the Japanese tokoname and uh, Yamaiki pots, British pots, antique Japanese pots, Chinese pots, plastic pots and a variety of other pots. Now the history of bonsai is inextricably tied in with the history of uh, Chinese ceramics and Chinese horticulture. I think in the Song dynasty and maybe even earlier, we could even go as far back as uh, 2000 years ago, the Chinese were making high-fired ceramics. Ceramics is pottery clay which is fired anything over 900 to about 1200 degrees centigrade. When it is around 900 or 1000 it's called earthenware and when it is fired over 11 or 1200 it becomes stoneware and then porcelain is fired even higher maybe even 1300 degrees centigrade. And from very early on, maybe 2000 years ago, the Chinese discovered that by firing ceramics to that high temperature, they get, get these beautiful uh, pots and containers. And of course, while making their ceramics, they also made flower pots. The Chinese have always been interested in plants and flowers. Those of you in the West who grow plants will know that anything with the botanical name with uh, Chinensis comes from China, so uh, Camellias, Forsythia, uh, all these beautiful plants and flowers originated in China and they've been bred for thousands of years. Chrysanthemums is another example. And when the Chinese discovered that putting plants in ceramic pots made both the plant and the pot more beautiful, so the two fused together and hence the word bonsai or pun choi and the Chinese call bonsai pun choi or the cultivation of plants in pots. So they're not just ordinary plants in a flower pot, but artistic plants in an artistic pot. And that's how the art of bonsai developed. So that briefly is the history and story of bonsai pots and bonsai. I'm now going to show you some very personal artifacts, which are my own bonsai. My journey in bonsai started in 1967. When I came to England in 1963, I didn't have much time for pursuing these things because I was pursuing my engineering career. But in 67, I suddenly got very interest, interested in studio ceramics. Those of you who know the history of uh, pop culture and modern art will know that London and the British art scene in the early and mid 60s was 
the be all and end all of all art. All the great modern artists like Hockney and uh, uh, of course the Beatles in those days. London scene was thriving with culture and art. But although a lot of the art was modernistic, there was another movement in art, in ceramics, which was called studio ceramics. And that was really started by the great Bernard Leach, the Englishman who went to Japan and started the tradition of the uh, Japanese uh, uh, ceramic culture. So he came back to England and started his pottery and snives. And a lot of people were inspired by him. But he was not the only famous artist. There were other very modern ceramic artists. And I was very inspired by them. So I started dabbling in ceramics. These are the pieces that I made back in the 60s. This, believe it or not, is my very first bonsai pot. In 1967, I started making pottery. This is stoneware pottery. And all I did was put this on a brick, wrap some clay around it, and hit it with a stick, and there you are. In those days, I didn't know anything about bonsai pots, so you can see that the inside is glazed, and the drainage holes are very small, and that was my very first pot, made in, I think, August 1967. When I got a bit more sophisticated, this was a pot I made probably a month later, I slabbed it, cut slabs of clay. The holes are still very small. And of course, if you look closely, my seal is on all the pots. So that's another pot I made. And as I progressed, I started making pots like this. So all these pots, and I can also throw, I was very good at throwing. So this is a pot I used to throw these in one piece. And this is a pot I probably made, I think, in 1974 or thereabouts. And also in 1967, I was making a lot of contemporary uh, pots and sculptured ceramics like this. So these were my experiments with pots. I was very good at throwing, so this is a pot, as you can see, the date is there, 1980. This is my own Celadon glaze. So, I was making a lot of bonsai pots, and my first home was a balcony flat. And of course, everything I grew on the balcony flat had to be in pots, so that's what inspired me to make the bonsai pots. Had I not lived in a flat or an apartment, I would never have gone into bonsai because I was forced to make pots to grow my plants. So I grew plants in pots and I made bonsai pots or pots that resemble bonsai pots and grew plants in them. So if you come to the nursery, you'll still see a lot of my pots. These are all the contemporary pots I used to make. Uh, this is a very contemporary style pot which I made in 1967. So that was way ahead of its time. So these are the pots I dabbled in, and that is what took my journey into bonsai. Had I not started making ceramics, and had I not lived in an apartment, I would never have gone into bonsai. So that's the story of my bonsai journey. There are four key criteria in choosing a pot, and these are the size, shape, style, and color. As you can see, the range of sizes is quite staggering. Look at it. This pot is about three or four feet long. I've got a pot which is six foot long, a ceramic pot. And then at the other extreme, I have timber pots, which I will show you in a minute. So that speaks for itself, the size. So that you get big pots and small pots. So obviously large pots are for large trees. And then there's the depth of the pot. And then the style, you have rectangular, ovals, deep cascades, circular pots. So that is the shape. And then, of course, the style, you know, some are ornate, you know, with beautiful rims. Some are plain. And then, of course, the colors. I know that most of the uh, pots you see here are unglazed pots. 
but there are also colored pots and the colors usually are blue, green, brown, uh, cream uh, and green. But basically speaking, the longest dimension, which is the length of the pot, I think would determine, be determined by the height of the tree. So if a tree is say uh, one meter tall, then the biggest dimension, which is the length of the pot, should be about half a meter or maybe at most about 70 centimeters. So we say half to two thirds the total height of the tree. But that's only a rough rule of thumb. You can break the rules because some of the literati trees, the diameter of the pot is probably only one tenth of the total height. So it depends on the style as well. So there are many factors involved. But basically speaking, the thicker the trunk, the deeper the pot you can use um, and the style. Rectangular pots which look rugged and chunky are for very powerful looking tree. I don't want to be sexist, but we uh, call certain trees masculine or feminine. So a very chunky, uh, rugged looking tree, we call them masculine trees. And the dainty, pretty trees, we call them feminine trees. So the masculine trees are normally put in rectangular pots, chunky, heavy pots. Um, and the delicate feminine trees are put in soft, shallow oval pots or circular pots. So that's another rough rule of thumb. Again, remember, it's only a rule of thumb. I mean, you can't use it as um, the be all and end all. There are no hard and fast rules. They're just guidelines. I don't like to use the term rule uh, because most of these things are guidelines. And not only that, I will show you when I show you the antique pots that a lot of the pots that have been used in the past were chosen uh, from cultural context and styles change. Just as styles change in the clothes you wear, so the pots have changed in fashion over the years. So I will now show you some examples from books of the different styles of pots that have been used over the years. And I will show you some of the antique pots that we have because that will give you a very good insight into the history of the bonsai pots. Because bonsai is an art form and all living arts should evolve, you will find that there are artists that have developed new concepts of pots. These pots were made by a British potter and these, he called them the pebble pots, and these were made back in, I would say, the mid 80s. So they are already about 30 years old. But for its time, back in the mid 80s, this was a very revolutionary concept of pot. Uh, so he made pots like this. And one of my great friends, Mr. Dan Barton, has made these very contemporary pots. And they are for the small trees, Shohin and Mami trees, and other British bonsai artists have made pots of slightly different shape. It may not be to everyone's taste, but at least they're experimenting with different shapes and forms. So as with all art forms, it should evolve. And uh, the more uh, dynamism there is in the development of pots, the better it is for the art. And as for materials, I know that the traditional bonsai pots were made from high fired ceramics. Um, in modern day times, we have plastic pots as well. I remember once uh, coming across a lady from uh, the UK who had lived in Japan for quite a few years. And she used to boast that she knew everything about bonsai. So when she came on the nursery, she said to me, why are you growing things in plastic bonsai pots? Uh, so she said they never do that in Japan. But when I took her close to the pot and turned the pot upside down, it had printed underneath the pot made in Japan. So um, she felt a bit sheepish that she was wrong. So we will show you here. These are beautiful, beautiful plastic bonsai pots. These are made in Taiwan. Some are made in Korea. So plastic pots are very good, not just for training, but once the tree is in the pots, they look so authentic that you can't tell that they're plastic pots. We're going to look at some of the pots that we use for many of the compositions we make on our nursery. And you will see that we've used different pots for 
different situations. This one, for instance, is a landscape scene. So for the landscape, we like to use an oval pot. So this oval pot shows a tree, very much an English style, broom style tree with a little river flowing through and a fisherman there. So this is a landscape, so we used a shallow oval pot. That one there is a conventional single trunk in formal upright tree. We've used a deeper pot because it had a big root ball. It could have gone into a slightly shallower one, but that's okay. Now this is another English landscape. And again, because it's a landscape, we used a shallow pot, but instead of a circular pot, we could have used, not a circular pot, we could have used an oval pot. We've used a shallow rectangular pot with slightly curved edges. So this is also suitable. This wouldn't have been right in a very deep pot. Deep rectangular pot would not be right for that. Now this is another classic landscape. And again, because it's a landscape, a shallow oval suits this particular tree. So does this. And when it comes to flowering trees, this is a apricot, but this is really a training pot. It could have gone in a rectangular pot. That would have been quite nice. When we come to repotting this tree, we will probably put it in a rectangular pot or even a slightly deeper oval pot would be nice. This is another example of an interesting landscape. It's like a terrace paddy field. And we've used a very, very shallow rectangular pot because this is a landscape or a picture. We always think of bonsai as a picture. Don't think of a bonsai just as a tree in a pot. It is really a picture. If you think of a picture and the pot is the frame, so the pot is really the picture frame for the composition you're making. So the picture frame can alter the feeling of the composition very much. So if you choose the wrong pot, you'll get a different effect. The best analogy for a bonsai pot is really like the clothes that you wear. Just as the clothes uh, can change the persona and the personality of a person, so the bonsai pot can change the look of a tree of a bonsai. When I started getting more involved with bonsai, this is in the very early 1970s, around 1972 or 73, I became so obsessed with bonsai that I used to collect any and everything to do with bonsai. So in those days, in England, there were a lot of antique shops and the antique shops used to sell quite a lot of Chinese ceramics. And among the Chinese ceramics that they used to sell were these beautiful porcelain plant pots. As you can see, they're really beautiful pots. High fired porcelain, which must have been fired to about 1300 degrees centigrade in all sorts of sizes. This is a small one. This is a shallow one, which is most unusual because in the 19th century and earlier, most of the bonsai pots were deep pots like this. If you look at pictures of old bonsai, they were invariably planted in deep pots of this style. This is a circular one, and this is a typical pattern, green cylinder, and this is an octagonal pot I've got a pot even larger than this, but it's too heavy to bring out and show you, but I've got large ones. And these I bought from uh, the British antique shops in the 1970s. And this is another one which is blue, which is an unusual color. And there are more. This is a, I think this is Japanese with a pomegranate flower on it. It could be Chinese, but I'm not sure. And these, of course, are a pair of Chinese bonsai pots with the apricot prunus miume on this one and this one has got the cloud pattern and a dragon but it's the same size and style these again high fired porcelain pots these are all from the mid 19th century and of course among my collection of pots are these very small mame pots 
which I collected on my trips to Japan. And as you can see, they're really beautiful dainty pots and they've all got a make a stamp on it. So you get pots of different sizes. So these are the small mame pots or thimble pots because they're like the thimble that you wear on the finger. And then you get these very large pots. There are also very collectible pots. This one is the most unusual Japanese pot I came across on one of my trips. Beautifully ornate, beautifully marked. So I collect a lot of the pots. The beautiful pots I sell and put trees in them because they are beautiful in their own right. I would like to introduce you to two of my books which have quite a bit of information on the choice of bonsai pots uh, for particular trees. Now, some of you will know that Bonsai Masterclass is one of my favorite books. This was written in 1986 or 87, and it is still um, a very popular book. I still get a lot of fan mail from people all over the world about this book. And in this book, Bonsai Masterclass, if I refer you to some of the pictures here, if you go through the book, you will see that there are examples. These prints are actual Japanese prints of famous trees. And you can see in this particular print that they've used quite a deep pot here for a landscape. And this is a woodcut of Hiroshiga. So that's a famous print. And then there are more examples of prints, again in all deep pots. We will show a close-up of this to show you the detail. So in the olden days, in the 18th and 19th century, pots of this style were used. And I'm sure if you re research some of the old Chinese manuals and even the Japanese manuals, you will find that there are quite a few examples of uh, these bonsai pots which are deep but no longer fashionable today. From the same book Bonsai Masterclass, the best guide I can offer you, and this will be shown in detail in this YouTube video, on page 18 and 19, there is a whole table showing the different styles of trees and the pots that will be suitable for it. And if you care to go through it, you will find this very, very informative. Also in my other book, which some of you may have come across, Bonsai Secrets, this was written, I think, in 2002. And in this book, on page, you will see, page 54 and 55, it shows the different styles of trees and the pots that can go into them, also in page 56. So I would suggest you look at it and we will home in on this page so you can get a better view of the types of pots that can go with particular styles of trees. But having said that, one should remember that the choice of pots is very much influenced by the culture and the time when people were growing trees. I noticed that there is a distinct difference between Japanese style bonsai and the pots and size they use and Chinese style bonsai. This is, of course is a very famous Japanese bonsai commemorative manual, which I think was produced in 1964, perhaps, I'm not sure, but it dates from that time. And it's a beautiful volume. And if you care to go through this book, you will see that the pot styles are beginning to change from the late I would say 19th and early 20th century. But the point I would like to make is that most of the Japanese bonsai artists, to my mind, 
they tend to underpot their trees. So this tree of a Chinese quince, it seems a rather large tree and the pot I would say is a bit small but to the Japanese masters is completely appropriate. So I would say there's no hard and fast rule as to who's right and who's wrong but it just uh, shows that different cultures and different people have different conceptions uh, of size and style of pot. If we look at some of the Chinese uh, bonsai or the Pungjing or Penjing, this is a com commemorative book called Ching Chung Bonsai. This is a book I helped to compile. This was produced in 1990 and I wrote the foreword for this book. You will see I wrote the foreword for this book here. And this is the collection of the Green Pine Monastery in Hong Kong where this grandfather Hao, who was a very great friend of mine and who was the abbot of the monastery, he had a vast collection of bonsai and his hobby was to grow bonsai. And even in 1990, Chinese bonsai wasn't that uh, popular in the West because most people were only uh, informed about Japanese bonsai. But if you look at the Chinese styles, their pots and the sizes are quite different from what the Japanese use. So if you look at the different styles of bonsai in different books like the Chinese books and the Japanese books, you will see that they are quite, quite different. So don't be too obsessed by what is right and what is wrong. So there are different points of view and I still think that the Chinese tend to put their pots uh, in much larger sizes than a Japanese bonsai would put them in. If we can look at some of these other books, this is again the Chinese bonsai manual. You only have to look at some of these compositions. I've just flicked open this page and look at that beautiful tree here on the left hand side. Now that's a beautiful pot but if it was a Japanese bonsai, they would put it in a much smaller pot. But here we find that this pot is quite big, but it's absolutely appropriate. So it just shows that there are only rough guidelines and it mustn't be considered gospel that only one thing is correct and everything else is wrong. I collect quite a lot of bonsai uh, antiquities and this is a Japanese photograph taken I think in the 1910 or 1920s which I came across in one of these London antique shops. It shows these lovely Japanese ladies but if we home in on this you'll see that there are a lot of bonsai in this corner and if you home in on this, you will see that a lot of the bonsai here are in deep pots like the ones I showed you earlier. So it just shows that as recent as the 1920s and 30s, most of the bonsai that were grown in Japan were used uh, in these deep uh, containers. As you can see, the choice of pots can be quite bewildering. But just standing in one tiny corner of my nursery, just our juniper collection, you can see the different types of pots that are used. This is a very tall and formal upright tree with plenty of driftwood. And there we've used a drum pot because it's more or less like a literati style. And it's quite deep because I need to keep the tree healthy. So I've kept it quite deep. If I went too shallow, I might have got away with it, but it may not have been quite right or it may not be good for the health of the tree. So that is one example. Now that tree with the driftwood is in a circular pot. That could have gone into a rectangular pot. Now this is a very good example. Classic uh, juniper, twisted trunk. It shows a beautiful tokoname pot. And uh, that pot is quite appropriate. But then 
the same style of tray I've used a drum pot and in case you think it's a ceramic pot no it's not a ceramic pot it is what we call a mica pot which is a dense polypropylene pot so it's a beautiful pot but it's not ceramic and then there's another very contemporary pot see this is what we call a primitive pot primitive pot just shows is not absolutely symmetrical but for that weird looking tree that primitive pot is appropriate I think it's a bit under potted I would say the pot could be slightly larger but that's a matter of opinion now this is another example of an under potted tree this has come from Japan like this but I would say the pot is slightly small you can get away with it but I would have preferred it to be a little bit longer depth of the pot is determined largely by the thickness of the trunk so if you look at that tree that thickness of trunk and that depth of pot that would be absolutely right also very rugged looking tree it hasn't been pruned yet so that rugged looking tree rectangular pot suits it literati trees we use our literati pots tree is about five foot in length and the trunk must be at least 30 to 40 centimeter in diameter at the base and i put it in a deep pot because anything shallower would not be good for the health of the tree so we use pots like this for these very large trees so i hope you've enjoyed this video and so be bold in how you choose your pots and enjoy your bonsai.